our aviation ordnance men first class. And what general locations did you serve? I did a four-year tour in off of the West Coast, so I did a Westpac, two Westpacs, um, out of Everett, Washington, and then I came to the East Coast and I did two quote-unquote med cruises from Virginia Beach. Heather, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? I grew up and I was living in New Hampshire when I enlisted. Do you recall the date? The day I left for boot camp, it was uh, February 22nd, 1995. And I think I signed my contract about a month before that. Why did you enlist? So my brother was in the Army when I was I graduated from college in May of that year, of 94, 94. And my brother had gone into the Army that summer. And I went to his boot camp graduation. And I said, hmm, I think I'd really like to serve. And I knew I didn't want to join the Army because my idea of a good time was not humping a 25-pound pack up hills both ways. So I said, let me see what my options are. And I decided against the Air Force because my dad was an Air Force vet. My cousin was in the Air Force. So it wasn't really something I was interested in. But I knew I wanted to travel. So I said, let me join the Navy. My grandfather was in the Navy, so he had been dying for one of his kids or his grandkids to join the Navy. And uh, his, his grandsons joined the Marines, the Army, and the Air Force. And his two sons had joined, two of his sons joined the Air Force. So I don't think he expected his granddaughter, one of two granddaughters, to join the Navy, but I did. So um, I teased my cousins that I was his favorite grandchild because I joined the Navy like my grandpa. He must have been thrilled. He was very excited, very excited. Where did you go to enlist? Was there a recruiter right there in your town? Yeah, I grew up in a pretty relatively big city in New Hampshire. So there was a recruiter in town. It was actually, um, I went with my brother because he was home on leave. Um, it was Christmas time. So he came home on leave and um, he went to see his army recruiter and I walked into the Navy recruiter's office. And where did you go for your basic training? I went to boot camp at uh, Great Lakes, Illinois because it was the end, uh, there no more separation of the genders in boot camp. So I was one of the first years that they had no more, um, Orlando wasn't open anymore. So what so. was boot camp like? Boot camp was very interesting. I think for me it was a little different because I was older, I had already been to college, I'd already lived away from home. Um, I was adjusted, I guess. And so for me it was hard for, uh, not to understand why people just couldn't be quiet and do what they were told. And for me, that was a hard thing for me to understand with other people. But um, I do remember that I have never been that cold in my whole life. Because when we got off the plane in Chicago, it was minus 22. And they issued us ski masks. And I was like, what am I going to use a ski mask for? I grew up in New Hampshire, so it's usually cold, but not cold like Great Lakes was in February. How long did basic training take? I think basic was eight weeks. And then I did... I did eight weeks at Great Lakes as in boot camp as a recruit, and then I did three weeks of uh, apprenticeship training in aviation apprenticeship training, also at Great Lakes for three more weeks. So, if I remember correct, I came home from my boot camp leave in the middle of May of that year. What was um, what kind of things did they train you in boot camp? What was that like? And then what was that like being a woman, and how was that different? Um, Sure. It was diff. Well, we, we did everything that everybody does. You know, you do the pe the physical part, and you do all of that. We um, in the navy, you we all go to shipboard firefighting. So you, you know, you're gonna in the navy, you're gonna probably go to a ship. So you need to know how to do firefighting. So everybody goes to shipboard firefighting training when I was there. Um, we all did a lot of classroom work, which was you know something that you don't expect to do when you go to boot camp. So I was. What kinds of things would they teach you in the classroom? Um, military, uh, naval history. Um, the, the organization of the military, of the Navy, how it's set up from the CNO down, um, rank and recognition, all the different jobs that there are out there. Um, what else? Do I, I, there was, I think there was so much. I, couldn't even, I, couldn't, I don't think I could remember all of it. Um, you know, how to wear your uniform, how to, how to dress, how to iron your clothes, you know, how to pack your, your locker because 
you know, you're in the Navy, you got to be able to pack a lot of stuff in a little bit of space. So for me, that was like, you know, that was the hardest part is just, you know, and then sleeping, you like how to be up for a four hour watch and sleep for four hours and then be up for a 10 hour day. And so that was, you know, something that inadvertently happens, I think, in boot camp. Um, they do all the shipboard stuff. When I was there, they did a lot of shipboard stuff, but I was sick in quarters because I had my wisdom teeth pulled. The, the days they did knot tying, everybody makes fun of sailors because we think we all know how to tie knots. I don't know how to tie knots because I missed that part of boot camp. And then I went into an aviation rate, so I didn't have to learn how to do that. Yeah. What was it like to be a female um, at that time, since you were one of the first integrated uh, units? Um, how were you treated, and was that at all awkward? I think that I didn't notice that we were treated differently because, you know, I was in um, a recruit division that was co-ed. So we had a brother, brother division, too. So it was all-female division and an all-male division. And what we did, we were in, our bunks were down two sides of the room. So one side of the room, the starboard side of the room, went with, the you know, their men, and then the port side of the room, the men came to us. And so we made one division that way. So we were a co-ed division. But I didn't realize how different we were until um, the there was a young man I had gone to boot camp with. So we had traveled from New Hampshire to boot camp together. And um, at graduation, he wouldn't talk to me. He was afraid to talk to me because I was a girl. And he was afraid of speaking to the females. What because, was he afraid of? Of the reaction of, of the other be, of That he was going to get in trouble for fraternizing. Oh because he was talking to a, to a female in boot camp and it's frowned upon. But there weren't enough women to have the whole entire boot camp campus. You know, the whole base wasn't integrated. So there were some integrated with females and some just integrated. Two male, two male divisions were integrated together. So it was really interesting. And I didn't realize how different we were until that point. And then when I, when I, went to, when I finally made it to the fleet and I went out to the fleet, that's when I really noticed how different I was. Do you remember any of your instructors from basic training? I remember, I remember my my E six instructor because he was um, he was a big guy. He was just hard to forget. His, he was a torpedo man, a TM one. His name TM one Knight. I don't know his first name, but he was a big, tall, burly, really very intimidating. Um, African American, and I was like, "Oh my God, this guy is scary." And then we get to find out about him, and he's a sub guy. And now that I know about subs, I'm like, "Hi!" And we imagine him on a submarine because he's enormous. So it was, it was, yeah. He stuck out in my mind because when we finished boot camp and I went to what they call ATD, which is apprenticeship training, um, I was 21. So when we would go out to the bar. We could have a drink and I saw him out at the club at the base bar and he bought me a drink and he's like I can do this now because you're not my recruit anymore and he's like now we're shipmates and I was like oh, okay that made sense to me and so but I remember him because he was one of those people that comes through and you're like what this guy is enormous now did everyone go to the um, apprenticeship training or were there, there selected uh so what happened was, is when I went into the Navy, I had a job, um, and but it required me to physically um, be able to pass a certain physical readiness test. So I went in because I wanted to be a rescue swimmer. And so when you enlisted, you can request what you want. You can, you can qual. You have you take the ASVAB and you have to qualify for certain jobs. And so I had qualified for a specific job, and I was wanted to be do that job as a rescue swimmer but I didn't pass the physical I missed it by two sit-ups or two sit-ups or two push-ups something to that crazy effect and I was like this is insane so when you don't qualify for a rescue swimmer school you lose your A school which is the schooling that you would get to have a specific job so when I didn't qualify for that school I automatically got enrolled into apprenticeship training so I was going into an aviation field so I figured Mines will stay in aviation. So I went to aviation apprenticeship training. So in the Navy, there's the aviation apprenticeship, and then there's seaman apprenticeship and a fireman apprenticeship. So, um, And I knew I didn't want to be a bosun's mate and, and do that kind of work, and I knew I didn't want to be a plumber or a welder, and uh, so I ended up in aviation. What kind of things did they teach you in the uh, aviation apprenticeship? So they, they teach us all about the different kinds of airplane platforms that there were, 
in in the Navy, um, what the different jobs entail as far as, you know, there's aviation firemen, there's aviation ordnance men, there's aviation mechanics, there's aviation electricians, um, any kind of aviation rate you can imagine, you learn about. And so it's so that you eventually can decide what you want to do into in that field. And so if you want to, because the, the next pay grade, you have to have a job and you have to have a, ra a rating. Do you get to choose after that training, or does the Navy choose for you? In theory, you should be able to choose. They kind of sell, sell you that you'll be able to choose, but what happens is is that you get orders to the fleet, and um, you're kind of at the need, whims of what your command needs. So I went to the Abe Lincoln, and when I checked on, there was probably 10 of us who were undesignated. We call them undesignated. We had all been apprentices. Um, and they took the first eight and they said, all of you guys are going to go to air department and air department is the guys who work on the flight deck and they chalk and chain and they fuel jets and it's a disgusting, dirty job. And that's what you were assigned to? Well, I got assigned to weapons because I was at the end of the line. Oh. And so the last two of us went to weapons department and I ended up working in weapons assembly. So Heather, what can you tell me about the Abe Lincoln? So the Abe Lincoln is an aircraft carrier. Um, when I got on board in 1995, they were about a month into a six-month deployment, but they were also the first West Coast aircraft carrier to be integrated with females. So I was part of the first crew of women to be deployed, to do a full deployment um, on an aircraft carrier. So that was 1995. So there was... Now, where did you... Was that off the West Coast? They were out of the West Coast. But when I met them, they were in the, um, in the Persian Gulf. Actually, they were in Dubai. And, and they were pier actually side. had to fly over? I had to fly over and pick the ship up in, in Dubai. So, and I couldn't even tell you. I think it was three days, about uh, probably 36 hours on the airplane... Going here to here to here, it was crazy. I don't even remember. It was just so foggy. Did you go in as an individual or were you with a group? There was a group of in? us. There was a group of us, but we didn't know each other. And we were all from different places. And we were some of us were brand new. But I do remember I was the only woman. You were the only woman. Yeah. I was the only what woman. What did that feel like? Um, that this is really historic times. It was, it was. And I, I think at the time I was just so young I didn't realize how, how crazy it was that I was going out to this aircraft carrier. Um, I think that some of the guys I was with, they didn't realize how historic this was either. But they were like, you're going to the Abe Lincoln? Because they were just dumbfounded that there were women on, them, on board. Because it was new for the West Coast. So anybody who had been stationed on the West Coast for a long time, nobody knew about them. And, and so it was really different. And, uh, and I didn't realize, when I got there, I figured out how different it was because everybody notices you. No. How many women, when you actually got on board, how many other women were there? There were 500, to about 500 women to 5,000 men on board. What can you tell me about the size and the purpose of the Abe Lincoln? So the Abe Lincoln, um, I don't know, I think it's, I think the Abe Lincoln is three football fields long um, and I can't even remember how many stories high. Um, at the time, we were the biggest um, ship on the West Coast. No longer are they. The Stennis is now the biggest ship on the West Coast. But, um, you know, our purpose was to provide air support and, and to, our, to the fleet and to protect the waterways. Um, we did an operation while I was out there in Afghanistan long before we went into Iraq. So, you know, I knew who bin Laden was way back in 95 because we were, we were doing air support for, for the ground troops well, well, at that time. Tell me a little bit more about that. What was the first, when you landed, well, right. when you caught your ship and you were in the Persian Gulf, right. what was the first operation that you were involved with? Um, well, I worked in weapons assembly, but I remember doing, learning, you know, how to do my job and putting together... Um, you know, a lot of times putting together live bombs to go on airplanes that didn't come back. So you didn't have to take them apart. You had to put them together, but you didn't have to take them apart. And I want to say that the first mission I remember them going on and us doing support with was um, when our battle group was firing tomahawks into Afghanistan. 
to try and flush out Bin Laden. I don't remember what the name of the operation was, but definitely was what so I remember. this is in 1995? 90, yes, 95. Um, what can so. you tell me in any detail about that operation, and how much did you know about uh, Bin Laden? I didn't know a lot about Bin Laden. I knew about Afghanistan because I was a little, you know, I had been to school and I was a little bit of a history buff, so I knew about Afghanistan and what had been going on there. But I wasn't aware of Bin Laden and what he was doing or what he had done or what he had been capable of. You know, you, you, it's like living in a cocoon sometimes when you're on a ship because um, in 95 there was no email, there was no internet. Um, so all of your information came from newspapers or what the Navy decided to let you read about or release and letters from home. And it was regular paper letters from home. It wasn't, you know, emails from home. So that was really um, something that I had to figure out. And so it was different because I didn't know about him, but I was like, this is my job. This is what we got to do. You, get, you know, and we kind of just put your, you know, nose to the grind and you just go to work. So you were actually arming bombs that were leaving and you knew they weren't coming back. Did you know where the bombs were going? Not at the time. Not at the time. So, so. Uh, what kind of bombs? Um, mostly um, we were building 500 pound or 1,000 pound bombs. And I think I was just too naive to realize exactly what that meant, but certainly. When you say building, what do you mean? So I worked in weapons assembly at that time and it was called the G3 division and what we did was we assembled so people see them all completed when you see an airplane loaded with them they're all well they don't come like that they come in parts so our job was to take the body of the bomb and put it on a table put the back end of the bomb on put the fuses in put the arming wires on put them back on a skid we call it a skid a little trailer and send it to the flight deck so that the, the, the crew up on the flight deck crew could load them up. When you were, when that was your job, is that what you did the entire time that you were on the Abe Lincoln? Um, I did that for a good part of, I, di I definitely did that for all of the, the 95 deployment. And then um, when we got back from deployment, I was really fortunate in that the Abe Lincoln sent me to school. So they sent me to AOA school. So I went to Tennessee for, I think, three months to learn more about our rate, and just to get rated. So they call it getting rated. What's AOA stand for? Um, AOA school. So aviation ordinance is exactly what the, is what the job was. And the A school is just your your primary school to learn how to do your job. So everybody has an A school if they've gone to school. So I went to Tennessee for three months, and I came back, and our ship was actually in the shipyards, and we were going through a um, an overhaul. So they put us in dry dock, and then once we were done with dry dock, um, we went out and had to do sea trials, and I went to ordnance control. When you um. You wanted to be a rescue swimmer and you ended up arming bombs. How yeah. did you feel about that job? Um, I, I actually really liked the challenge of it. So I liked the challenge of doing something totally out of my comfort zone. You know, um, I went to college before I went into the Navy and I have a bachelor's degree in social work. Completely opposite of what anything I had ever thought about doing while I was in the military. So I was really... Um, I was I was okay with it because I was really having a good time. I worked with the good people. I worked. I had a really incredible gunner who was a trailblazer in herself. So I worked for a female gunner, unheard of at the time. So it was really a fun time, and I enjoyed um, I enjoyed not jumping out of helicopters into the water. I think my parents were happy that I decided not to jump out of helicopters and into the water. Now, what would your typical day be like? Because you, you weren't arming bombs every day. You would only arm them when the planes were going out? Yes, well, we would only build them as they were needed. So when I was doing my first tour and I was on the Lincoln and I was doing weapons assembly, so when you're out to sea, you do 12 hours on and 12 hours off. So you work from, say, 7 to 7, 
And then from seven to seven, you have to do, you know, your, your daily stuff, your cleaning, your, your inventories. We had to do magazine checks, we called them. Um, we did all of that stuff every day. And then when you're 12 hours off, you know, we wrote letters home, you watch television. Um, I think at the end of my first deployment, we knew all the words for Gump by heart because they showed the movie on the, on the television, on the ship's television so often. Um, there's just different things to do. You go to the gym. Um, so there's different things to do, but it was a lo they were long days some days. And then, you know, there's always, there's all training and, you know, everything else you have to do. So how was the treatment by the male counterparts on the um, I'm, you know what, I I didn't have any problems with them. They were good to me. Like I said, I worked for a female gunner. Um, our officer in charge of our division was a female, um, so she she ruled kind of with an iron fist. You know, um, I think the ship's rules had to be had to be kink, the kinks had to be worked out. When I got on board the Lincoln, there was a two inch rule. So you had to stay away. A female and a male couldn't work together. They had to be two inches apart at all times. So anybody who's ever been on any kind of ship knows that the passageways are not that wide. That you're not going to be able to walk past a guy or walk with a male and a female or not going to be able to walk down the same passageway and be less than two inches away from each, and more than two inches away from each other. And when you build bombs, it's impossible to do your job and do it safely without being really close to each other because you know, somebody has to hold the hold the back of a, the fin up and run wires through the back of the bomb. So, you know, I, I have small hands, so that was my job a lot of the time. So you're kneeling down and you're an inch and a half or half an inch away from a, a man. But it was one of those things that, you know, the ship, w it was a learning curve for everybody. So the whole ship was trying to learn how to, how to do that. So it was interesting. How long uh, were you out on that cruise before you went back for the AO A school training? I was. Uh, I did. Well, I that was five. I was there for five months. We did a five month deployment, and we came back, and we were probably back for. I, I was probably on board as part of the Lincoln for a year before I went to Tennessee to go to school, and then I went back to back to the Lincoln after that. All right. So you, after your five months. Uh, over in Afghanistan and right. the Persian Gulf, where did you came back to Tennessee? No, we came back to Everett, Washington, which was our home port. And you stayed in Everett. We stayed in Everett. Well, I stayed on the ship because I was young and a, you know, low man on the totem pole. So we all stayed on the ship. So you actually live on. I the actually ship, lived on the ship. Dot. Even though we're pier side, yeah. If you weren't at that time, if you weren't married and you were an E three or below, you lived on the ship. And how long did you live on the ship at Everett? Um, I lived on the ship. I lived on the ship for the whole time we were. I was there for f most of the four years, except with a with a small part, except for when we were in the dry dock where nobody lived on board. So, and then when I left there, I we were in dry dock. We were back in the shipyards after another deployment, um, doing which uh, shipyard? Bremerton. So we were we were doing a post deployment overhaul. All right, so you, you, you went back to Everett, you were living right. on the ship pier side. Right. Um, after Everett, where did the ship go? So the ship, we did, okay, so what happened was that we went on a deployment, we came back, yep. we did a, a, a home port change from California to Everett, Washington, um, and we were in Everett for a while. We did a dry dock period, which where they put the ship on blocks. And that was at Bremerton? That was in Bremerton. And then we did a, um, we moved from, we did another, I did another deployment on the Lincoln in 1998. Where was that deployment? That was to the west, to another west pack, back to the Persian Gulf. Can you um, describe that? Can sure, so that deployment, deployment I, we left, um, we left, I don't even remember the time of the year, but we left relatively early in the year. Um, we did a, a port visit to Hong Kong. And we were the first American aircraft carrier to go there after it had been turned back over to Chinese rule, which was kind of cool. It was really different. Um, I had never been to Hong Kong, so that was really an interesting place to, to go. So we went to Hong Kong, and then we did a port visit to Singapore. Then we went to the Persian Gulf. We probably did, during the course of a few months, three, four months, we did 
I minimum five port visits to um, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. And then we obviously doing missions in in, in there. And were, were you still? Um, I wasn't doing weapons assembly. I was working in ordnance control. So at that time, ordnance control, we were required to, we were in charge of knowing where all of the armament was for the whole ship. And when a squadron called us and said, this is what we need, we, it was our jobs to let the division who does assembly know um, how much and what kind of what they need to put together. So, and that was, that was interesting. That was, you know, a different, that was definitely a, a very big learn in management and logistics. It was a really logistical job. Sounds like it could be very stressful. It could be. It could be stressful. Um, I was a E4 at the time. And so I was kind of the, one of the more junior members of the ordnance control crew. But um, I was still working for the same gunner, which was really great because she moved to ordnance control. So it worked out really well. And um, she handpicked her crew there, which made it nice because we all worked really well together. And it made it, uh, and the, the guys who I worked for were always very generous with their knowledge and their skill. And so it was, it was a good learning experience for me and prepared me, I think, to leave and make E5. Was it? Pretty much the same crew and the same sailors that it, on the whole ship went from your first deployment to your second deployment, or was it a huge change? Um, there wasn't a huge change, but there was always a, there was always a significant change, which is what it's like at most deployments. Most people, if they're due to rotate to a new command or they're due to get out of the navy, they'll oftentimes extend through your deployment so you finish your whole deployment. Um, just because financially that makes the most sense. You're in the Persian Gulf, you're not, you know, you're making a lot of money because you're not buying anything and it's tax-free money and there's has and so all the, all the perks that come with having been over there. So we were fortunate because we didn't have a new crew in ordnance control for a long time so it worked out really well but we had all, most of all of us had been through that whole shipyard period together which is m more stressful I think than um, deployments are. So it was um, it was a, a lot of over turnover, but it was always um, gradual. It wasn't like fifty people left, fifty new people came. It was like two people left, one person came. So in nineteen ninety eight, that's three years later. Could you tell the difference in what was going on politically and in the world, or just being on the ship? And to you, what was just your job changed? Um. I think that I didn't notice so much what was going on in the world, um, just because you know I was young. I was we were busy. We were doing you know what we needed to get done to get ready to go on deployment or to get ready to come back from deployment. I was thinking about where am I going to go next because I was up for orders. Am I going to reenlist because I had to decide to reenlist or not? So that was a huge um, part of with that last year and a half or so was like when I was um, finishing up my time on the link and trying to decide if I wanted to stay or if I wanted to go. How long was your second deployment in the Persian Gulf? Uh, we were there for six months. And where did you go after that? Um, we did a, when, when the ship left the Persian Gulf, we did two port visits to Perth and Hobart in Australia and Tasmania. Can you tell what, what's a port visit? So um, after we've been working for so hard, the ship um, pulls, usually we anchor out into a port, in a foreign port, um, and we get some liberty time. So you get some time off and you can go into town and, and do that kind of stuff. So that's what, um, that's what a port visit's like. And it's just a way to unwind and let sailors get off the ship. And you know, How long is it typically? Usually about five days, six days. Um, and then depending on where you, who you're attached to, we have um, days where you have to work. So you might, if you're there for six days, you have four days off and you have to work one day. Now, when your aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. the Abe Lincoln, when, did it travel by itself? Is it one ship out or did you travel with a convoy? Did you travel what? So we were the um, central part of a, they call it a battle group, 
and um, don't I don't know all the ships in a battle group, but there's a an array of ships that travel with and a submarine that travel with the aircraft carrier. So you're never alone, is it, when the aircraft no. out in the middle of the ocean? No, no, we're never. And there's always uh, smaller ships and supply ships and destroyers and frigates that all also have their own jobs to do. But so when you do a port call, does the whole battle group do no. a port call? No, the whole battle. No, because that would just that would just you know that'd be like you know eight thousand sailors in one port. And f- no, no, no. One air the aircraft carrier goes once, and then sometimes the, with the, if the aircraft carrier comes in, the Lincoln will come in. Then two smaller ships will come in after it leaves, and they kind of it's a rotation kind of thing. So they can go to a lot more places than the aircraft carrier can because they sit. They don't. You know, their, their keel isn't as low into the water, and they're not nuclear. Some of them aren't nuclear, so. After your two port calls, where did you go? We um, left there up uh, Perth, Australia. We came back stateside, so we stopped in Hawaii at Thanksgiving time. Not a bad deal. And then we went back to Bremerton. We stopped in San Diego, drop off our airplane squadrons that were that are part of the ship. And then the ship's crew, we bring our we bring our ship back to our home port in Washington. And how long then did you dock in Bremerton? Um, we were probably there for nine months. I left while they were still there, so they did. I didn't go. I went on. I left in '99. They went on another deployment after that. While you were in Bremerton, were you living on the ship again? No, I was living in barracks because we were in a sh- we were doing a. An overhaul, a post-deployment overhaul. And what do you mean you left? I transferred. So I went from, I transferred from Pax River, and I took orders to, uh, I pa- transferred to Pax River, Maryland from the Lincoln. So I took orders to a test squadron um, was this in Maryland. Was your request for the transfer? Well, it was my time, so we go on a rotation schedule. Um, and then at that point, I had become, I had been promoted to E5. So we, you're able to pick orders when you fulfill your C obligation. So I did, my C obligation was over on the Lincoln and I was up for orders and um, I said, I'll move myself because I'm a single sailor. So I'll move myself if you'll send me to the East Coast because I was from the East Coast, I want to come back to the East Coast. And they said, sure, and they sent me to Pax River. What was your job at Pax River? So I was still, you know, I still obviously did aviation ordinance, um, but this time I went to a squadron which means I worked on airplanes. Um, I worked on F-18s and F-14s because we were a test squadron. We had um, two platforms of airplanes and we, we tested new equipment on old planes and new planes with old equipment. That makes any sense. So there was a new airplane that came out, a modification of the F-18 for instance came out while I was there. And we took all of the old the ordinance that is carried on an old F-18 and s- to test it and see how it works on a new F-18. That's a very interesting. It was really um, interesting. Did you have any memorable experiences from that time? Sure. So I was um, at Pax River um, during September 11th. Uh, nine, right, so one oh one. This is two thousand one. You yep. must have re-enlisted. I did re-enlist. When, when I re-enlisted before I left the Lincoln, so I think I re-enlisted in ninety nine. What made you decide to re-enlist? Um, I was having a really good time in the Navy. I was having a really good time doing my job that I was doing, and I wanted to do an East Coast deployment. And I said they were offering a bonus. A reenlistment bonus. So if I said, well, if I'm going to reenlist, I'm going to reenlist so I can do a shore duty rotation, and I can do a sea rotation, and get the most for my get the most dollars for my reenlistment. So I reenlisted for six years. Wow! Not knowing that 9/11 was coming. Not knowing that 9/11 was coming. All right. So you were at Pax River sure. when 9/11. Can yeah. you describe that? Um, sure. So I was working in the squadron and I was kind of, um, I was a team leader, what they call, and my colleague and I were getting ready to go out and load an aircraft up to go on a test flight. And, uh, this particular day... Do you actually go up in the aircraft? We don't go in the aircraft. Pilots take the airplanes up in the aircraft. Take the aircraft up and they, they fly them. They do maneuvers and, 
and they check all of the, I don't know, it's a lot more technical than I quite understand. Um, but that particular day we were loading an airplane, we call it wingtip to wingtip. So it was full of either fuel tanks or weapons of some sort. And um, we had just finished loading an airplane and, well, let me backtrack a little bit. One of our, we, we had some fellows who had gone out to pick up the weapons from, from the weapons station and they were in our truck and they, there's a radio in the truck and they're listening to the radio and the radio announcer is talking about how an airplane had just flown into one of the towers at the World Trade Center. And we were like, oh my God, that's crazy. So we turned the television on in our, off, in, our, in our shop and my colleague and I were like, well, let's go. We got to go load this plane up. And we go to load the plane up and he and I are walking out the door and we turn around and look and the television, the second airplane hit the second tower. And we were like, something's going on. And we go out, we do our job. We load this plane up. It's fully loaded. We get it all finished. And um, somebody from our, one of the other um, sailors at our command comes out and he says, he goes, a plane just flew into the Pentagon. And we were like, oh my God. So we were scrambling because we now we had to download this whole airplane because they didn't know what was going on. So we had to take all of our airplanes and put them in our hangar bay because they wanted to clear the flight line in case you know something was gonna happen so that we would have these assets in case something had happened. And um, I remember um, you know, seeing the smoke from the Pentagon in the, in the air, in the sky, in the air, because it's very distinctive and it's, you know, we all know what fuel smells like when it burns because we work around airplanes. And, um, that day was the longest day I remember ever having in the Navy because I had been at work for, you you at work for eight hours and then we stayed because we had to set up watches and we had to figure out how do we get our airplanes that are not equipped to fire live missiles and live ordnance, how do we get these airplanes ready in case we need to put them on alert for an attack? And so my colleague and I, oh, one of my shipmates and I were trying to figure out how to put a gun back together because we had no guns in any of our airplanes. Um, they were equipped to carry guns, but we took them out for, they put other things in there, a ballast, a weights in there, or they put cameras in there. So trying to figure out how are we going to do this and what can we, what can we load where? So, um, and the commander of the base was a, a Marine. And I remember telling the Marine Colonel, he wanted to load rockets, um, on one of our airplanes. And I remember telling him, and I didn't even think I was going to be this brave, but telling this Marine Colonel, very intimidating man. So you can't load that over there. You cannot put rockets next to a fuel tank because of the way the rockets fire, you're gonna blow up the airplane. And I was thinking this pilot doesn't know that you can't load rockets. And so just, you know, just the chaos of all of what's going on on the base. And I remember not being able to call home. And I know my mother is at home freaking out. So I was able to call my friend who lived off base in town. And I said, can you please call my mother and tell her we're okay, I'm okay, everything's fine, that I'm still working. and. So, and then I don't think we, I, I actually don't think I had an opportunity to speak to my parents probably for maybe the next five or six days. So, cause you know, we, getting on the base was, after you left the base, getting back on was hard. You couldn't, we couldn't drive our cars to our squadrons. We had to park them out on the outskirts of the base and they had to take a bus in and a shuttle. It was, it was crazy. And the security measures that went down. And we had a lot of civilians that worked with us. So it was, you know, trying to get them to understand that the security purposes and you no, know, you can't come in here if you don't have your ID. And so it was really um, a time when I'll, you know, like most people of my generation, never forget what happened. But at the same time, remember how it felt to be in that situation and be like, oh, you know, knowing I'm leaving, I'm going to be leaving this command in a little while. And uh, I'm probably going to a command that's going to be out there and doing something. And little did I know, we realized how, how soon that would be. But So when, when all this was going down, uh, so what did you arm them with? So we armed them with rockets. We armed them with um, partially, part inert, part live missiles, air to air missiles, air to ground missiles. Um, and, and that's it. That's what we had. We had some bombs and that's what we did. You know, um, we did what we could and we were 
relatively close to Virginia Beach. So we knew that if anything happened in DC again and we were going to be launched, that that was like the, we were the last resort, um, but we were ready nonetheless. And so we had our airplane all loaded and set out and we had watches out on the flight line. The plane was sitting on the side of the flight line waiting to get launched if we, that's what they needed us to do. But we knew that the squadrons in Virginia Beach would be able to do more damage, much more fast than we would be able to. So you were backup for the squadron? We were backup for the Virginia Beach squadrons. And you had one aircraft? Or? We had two aircraft that were loaded and ready to go. Did so. you ever have to use them? No, we didn't, thank God. Thank God. So that must have been a crazy few days. It was. It was like a crazy week, two weeks. And then, you know, after that, everything changed for everybody. But for us, it really changed because security became so different than it had been in the past. Permanently. Permanently, yeah. Permanently. How so. did it change? So, um, you know, access to, to certain parts of the squadron were much more strict. Um, access to get on the base, you know, gates were closed. There used to be three gates. They went down to one gate. Um, you know, armed Marines manning gates and, and, and manning things. That was, you know, that was something that we, you know, you didn't see. Like we, we all, we work with Marines because we have fly the same kinds of airplanes essentially. Um, and there's a Marine squadron that was at Pax River, but you know, to see like Marines with rifles and live weapons and it was it was a little different and it was you know having your car searched now at that point you'd already been on two deployments to mm -hmm. the Persian Gulf and after 9-11 did you realize then uh, what the world outlook was and that you were probably going to be involved yeah I I had a even though nothing in you know even though the president at the time didn't say anything and nobody really had too much to say about it when when the details started coming out and I knew I was transferring to a C squadron um, I knew we would be going we would be going to do something because there was no way that our government was we were going to let them just sit by idly um, be it it was going to be some large-scale operation or it was going to be some small operation um, did I know that it would be to the extent it is now I had no even little bit of a clue that it would be like that but did I know that we would be involved in some way I I had a good suspicion we would be involved some way so you then how long after that were you transferred to the C squadron September I transferred in December of that year of 01 so you stayed at Pax River from September to December to December and then I transferred um, to Virginia Beach and I went to school for a few weeks, and then what? Uh, I went to some advanced um, armament school. And then I left when I finished school. I got a port call. They call it a port call. So to meet my ship and my squadron overseas. So and I left. I left the week before Christmas. A week of Christmas. I left to go meet my squadron um, while they were on deployment already. Where did you have to meet them? Um, I ended up meeting them in France, but it took us a long time to get there. So <laughs> there was a group of us, and that now, now I'm, I've done it already twice. This is my second time meeting my ship. So um, they actually flew us from Norfolk to Rota, Spain, to Sigonella, Italy. And then they flew us back to Rota because they realized the ship wasn't as far as they thought it was. And they flew us back to Rota, Spain, and we flew from Rota, Spain on board, and we flew onto the ship, which was a really cool experience to actually get to have. So not not everybody gets to do that in the Navy. Um, we call it catching a, you know, we caught a, we we got trapped, we caught a trap, we caught the wire, which was, you know, something you'll never ever forget in your whole life. So getting shot off the catapult is one thing, but being landing on an aircraft carrier while they're out to sea is a completely different thing. So. And even though you can't see anything, it's still, like, you know, one of those, like, nail-biting things. Wow. Um, what ship did you catch? Um, I, we landed on the USS Harry Truman. Now, the USS Harry Truman is another aircraft, aircraft carrier. carrier. Yep. Is it similar to the A. Lincoln? It is. It's just newer. 
So the side number on the Lincoln is 72, and the side link number on the uh, Truman is 75. What was your job on the USS Harry Truman? So when I was on the Harry Truman, I was attached to an airplane squadron, an F-18 squadron. And that meant we had a complete set of air, uh, F-18 Hornets. That, and my job there was to, um, as a weapons loading, so we loaded all of the weapons and downloaded all the weapons from the aircraft. We we're in charge of the armament systems, they call it. Were they the same kind of uh, armament, 500 and 1,000 pound bombs? And others, yes. There was um, missiles, bombs, bullets. We did all of that. We loaded all of that onto the airplanes and downloaded it when it wasn't used. How often would the Hornets go out with bombs? We went out every day with bombs. We went out every day. We had training missions, um, you know, all, until, until President Bush said we were going to invade Iraq. We did a lot of training exercises, um, a lot of training exercises with other foreign countries, a lot with the British. Um, and then when he said, we're going, we... Where were you? Were you still around France doing all this training? We, we, did, we had done, um, let's see, we were, uh, I remember, because we were in, um, I was in France for Christmas, and then we were in Crete for New Year's. And then the first of the year came, and that's when we he had the president sent us into um we're sending getting ready to send troops into Iraq, um and we moved our ship from where we were at um we were supposed to go we went to Italy so we left Italy and we went to um off the coast and ended up going to the Adriatic. So we were flying our airplanes around Turkey to support the ground troops in Iraq when they went in to invade in Iraq. So. How much uh, did you know at the time uh, of what we were actually doing? I, we knew what we were doing because at that time I was in E5, I was kind of in the middle of the, middle of the chain of command and you know, we know and you know when you watch these airplanes go out loaded, they got 3,000 rounds of bullets in them, they've got bombs on them, and they come back with fuel tanks and no bullets, you know, you know really well what, what they're doing. And we knew we were supporting ground troops. And we knew that we were in the Adriatic because we had to fly, our planes had to fly around Turkey and they couldn't fly through Turkey's airspace. So, and we knew we were doing, it I, I'll never forget the first three days of that we were actually doing flight operations to support ground troops because it rained. I mean, sideways rained for three days straight. I remember standing on the flight deck underneath wings of airplanes so that we could try and stay a little bit dry so you could wipe your goggles off so you could see because the rain was just coming sideways. And on an aircraft carrier, you need 30 knots of wind to launch airplanes off the catapults. So we were always driving into the storms, but three days of rain. And the first day, all right, the second day, I would work in the day shift. We come in and we're like, we're looking to see if night shifts got dry clothes. Because if they have dry clothes, it's not raining anymore. And they didn't have dry clothes. And then the third day, I was like, oh my God, they still don't have dry clothes. And when we came in on the fourth day and their clothes were damp, we knew it stopped raining finally. But it was cold, it was so cold. So your twelve-hour shift, shift. Can you tell me what that? What, what, what were you doing exactly during that twelve hours? Um, the twelve-hour shift ended up being more like fourteen hours. <laughs> um, you know, I worked. We worked six to six, six a.m. to six p.m. And from the time you get up, we did um, the time you check in. We mustered. We call it mustered. We all were accounted for. Um, we got our tools and you go up to the flight deck with your, all your gear on and we did inspection of all of our planes. Um, the night shift loaded all the planes for the first morning launches and um, we did all the inspections and made sure everything was okay. And then when flight operations started, we were up there all day. I mean, to the point we that the flight deck we were day. on the flight deck all day um, for the most of the, the, whole, the whole day. Um, we didn't even get, we got off the flight deck to eat, eat chow, but we had to eat box lunches. 
So we eat box lunches in our shop, which was like one one stairwell below the flight deck, and we'd run down, we'd eat in chow, and then we'd run back up and you know eat bologna sandwiches or. I remember they used to give you Oreo cookies, and we all used to take the Oreo cookies and stuff them in our float coats, which were our life jackets that we had to wear. You know, totally we were supposed to do that, but nobody cared because we were so hungry during the day. How long were you uh, supporting ground troops? Um, we started flying, I want to say we started flying there in February, um, and we came home. We were there probably four months, maybe more. At least, at the very minimum, we were there for three months because we had, when we were on our way back to the States after President Bush made his announcement on the Lincoln that, you know, the war was over, um, we were on it, we started heading home and we had, uh, we had earned two beer days, they call them. So we earned two beer days, so that's at least 90 days because it's 60 days without a port visit and you earn a beer day. <laughs> so did you get your two beer days? We got our two beer days. Well, we got our two beer days in one in one day. So they we stopped flight operations and they close the flight deck down and they barbecue out and they bring on cases and cases of beer and everybody is you're issued um, two beers per beer day. So we each got four beers. So, but when you haven't been out, when you haven't been in port for, for you know, 90 days or 100 days or whatever, you know, four beers goes a long way. Uh, do you recall what the reaction was around you when uh, President Bush declared the war was over? Um, I think everybody was relieved. Um, we knew, we were all at that time, I remember, concerned that we were going to get extended and we weren't going to be able to go home on time. And we we're pushing around Christmas time, you know, we had been gone through Christmas and people wanted, just wanted to get home um, for the summer in Virginia Beach would have been nice. You know, everybody really wanted to get back. And we were, I think we were excited because we knew that we had completed a job and we were happy that we had done our job successfully. And when he said we were done, we were hoping that we were going to be done. Um, the, the part of me that's educated had a feeling we weren't going to be done, and I was right because we went back to Iraq in a year and a half later. Um, so when you came home, where did you go? So we came home, and the, the Truman's home port is Norfolk, but my squadron's home port, our home port is uh, Virginia Beach uh, um, in Oceana. So I moved into, I actually lived in an apartment in, Oce in Virginia Beach for a while, and I stayed there while I was attached to the squadron. So we came back and we went to, we just completed, we started doing, you know, unpacking and to unpack into a new hangar after you've been gone for six months and so it takes some time to get used to and then we resume flight operations and training because you always have to be ready to, to, to deploy again so you could deploy at any time. So we knew we were going back out with the Truman but there's a period where you stand down they call it so everybody gets to take some leave, you get to go on vacations. And then when you start going back to normal operations, we have a regular flight schedule. Um, we had to do training exercises. We had to do an inspection cycle. And then we had so to go. So would you have to go to work? It yeah, we had to go to work. It, it was no. It was when you when we were back home. It was more like more an eight hour day. It was a regular nine to five job or eight to five job or um, just depended um, on what was going on and what we had going on that day. So. It just depended. So most of, most days, um, it was you know we went into work for seven or seven thirty, and we were done by four four thirty. So and then the night shift would come in, and they would work their shift, and then they would go home, and we'd start again in the morning. So it just really depended on what was going on and what we had doing. We also you know during that time we had all these inspections. We also were required. We went to Nevada. It sounds silly. Airplane squadron, Navy's in Nevada. We were in Fallon, Nevada. We spent six weeks in Nevada. Doing what? Doing training because um, there's not too many places that the Navy can drop bombs. And so we go to the desert in Fallon and we do practice bombings in Nevada because there's a bombing range outside of um, Reno. And so we spent six weeks there doing training exercises with our squadron. Wow. Loading bombs and 
and, and practice bombs and getting ready to go back on another deployment. How long were you in port in Nevada before you went on your next deployment? Um, I guess we got back from Fallon. We were probably there for maybe two months before we went on deployment. We went on deployment October. Uh, 2002? Um, no, October of 2004. Where were you deployed then? We went and we did another what the Navy calls med cruise, except for that this time we went through the Straits of Hormuz and we um, ended up in the Persian Gulf. So when we went on our first deployment, we were in the Adriatic and then we went through and we were ended up in the in the Persian Gulf. So we did some port visits on our way there. We did we went to France, we went to Italy, we went to Slovenia. Then we went to the Persian Gulf, so, so the Lincoln could go home. Time in the Persian Gulf. Yes, yeah, I went there twice with the Lincoln and once with the Truman. All right, you won. You're back in the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Um, we did more because we weren't done in Iraq. We were. We actually went out there to relieve the Lincoln, who got turned around. They had to. They were on their way home and had to go back to the Persian Gulf. Why? Um, because there was no aircraft carrier in that presence and they thought it was important to have air support for the ground troops that were still in Iraq. So the Lincoln could go home after their extended deployment. We went, we went and relieved them. And we spent, I, I, we spent most of our six month deployment in the Persian Gulf. So it probably took us two months month and a half to get out that way, to get that far out there. And then once we were there, we stayed there and, until we were, it was time for us to start turning back to come home, until we got relieved. But I'm not sure, I think the Roosevelt might have relieved us. But we, the United States, always wanted to have a presence. There. Always. So, There's so always an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. Lincoln had to stay until, until we could get there. Showed. Right. 